well. Jude, I love your vulnerability, transparency, and authentic care in each of your stories and, and illustrations. I love how you use these illustrations where you continue to reiterate where it's pain, but there's purpose in that pain. And to see that compassion that God's given you to help others see the truth and be free indeed mm -hmm. of what Jesus wants them to be free, mm -hmm. that he died for already. Um, it's so inspiring. June, um, Hope for the Heart Ministries, a ministry that you founded in 1986, which is now in 60 countries, six continents. Um, tell us what the vision is and was from the beginning for Hope for the Heart Ministries that God gave you. Mm -hmm. In one phrase, it's God's truth for today's problems. Mm. Nick, the problem I was having back then, there was no material. Mm. There's not a book that you could find, not a Christian book, on childhood sexual abuse. How could there not be? I mean... The statistics are one in three girls, one in five boys. How could there not be Christian material? And that bothered me. Mm. And there were other materials that, 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 you know, the topics that didn't exist. And so I was doing, I started doing radio. It wasn't my idea. Somebody said, you ought to do this. You ought to be on radio. Because, it's, and I said, I don't feel called to radio. And they said, well, if you're, heard here, what if you could be heard all these other places at the same time? And I thought, hmm. And so I really, it was others that encouraged that. But then when I realized we couldn't find material, I was doing topics that weren't heard on radio. Mm. We did sexual addiction. That wasn't heard. Wow. I mean, and when I would do like domestic violence, Childhood sexual abuse, it would be three to four times the amount of mail at that time. We just did mail. We didn't have call in at all. And but the the I would just see all these letters, mm. and and many would say, "I've never told anybody this before. I was abused," and they would tell what it would be, and it just gripped my heart. And um, so we started. Doing, I did a three-year course uh, called Counseling Through the Bible. And I talked to professional counselors and pastors. What do people come to you for? What are the, what are the topics? Mm. I gathered all these titles. Some were duplicates, just sometimes a different name, but got, got it down to 96. I did six 16-week semesters at Fellowship Bible Church in Dallas. I would teach on a Monday night and a Tuesday morning. And I didn't care who came. It wasn't about them. I needed to be writing the material mm. of definitions, characteristics, causes, and solutions. All of them had that model. Definitions. So we really define what does this mean? What does it look like? Characteristics, causes. Why does this happen? And then solutions. What are we going to do about it now? And so that was a, a I only taught that three year course one time, but that then I started taking each one and expanding. And then been, I had to actually had to uh, expand in a way, not just the 96, but I we started getting, well, why don't you have verbal and emotional abuse? Hmm. I didn't think about that. <laughs> so then we started adding certain topics and needed to do those because the people were needing help and they wanted to know biblically how to think, what to do. And um, it ended up later that that would be our number one. We had many books and that was the number one of all the many books. And those and basically... Nine years, uh, they sold two million two hundred thousand, and I'm just going. Uh, I, I I didn't know. 
I, I had no idea. I don't even love writing. <laughs> I don't. No, no, you like speaking more. Yeah. Karen, you're, you're the pioneer of, of developing these resources to actually equip the church to have an atmosphere and platform or canvas, however you want to say it, to start the conversations within the church. Um, so many churches mm -hmm. feel like there are so many things that's inappropriate. H how can you say that any point of anyone's life is inappropriate to address or their feeling or their experience or whatever problems they're going through? That's the purpose that the church should be engaged in. It's such a pioneering ministry since 1986 and really equipping those people who are looking for resources because my dad was a pastor mm. and I know how it is within the church when you can only do the best with what you have at times. And there are groups though that form um, that can maybe talk about some things, but there are some depths of resources that just the church would never have the ability to use without the Hope for the Heart Ministries. And there are millions of people using that. So praise God for the Hope for the Heart Ministries. Um, all the resources, June, uh, on all the resources that you supply as a ministry to the globe, what's the highest request requested resource hmm. that that people are coming to you, churches are coming to you to say, hey, we need resources on this. What's the highest request? For years, the number one topic was anger. Anger. I, I, it was just, it, it didn't matter, because I would see every year what uh, people had requested and, and received from our ministry. And then um, it may be uh, the, the verbal and emotional abuse. I don't know, um, but but forgiveness is always going to be in the top mm, three. Mm. Uh, there are issues of, of anxiety, depression. So, so the emotions, people feel those, and many times they don't like what they're feeling, or they want to know, what do I do, or how can I help others? Mm. And it, isn't that wonderful? Mm. That people have a heart. To help and say, well, I can let me let me get this, uh, and and it's not like it's just this long, 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 long dissertation. Uh, we've got to be succinct enough that people can understand the definitions, characteristics, causes, and solutions. But those solutions are are vital. For some of them, you have you really need to start with um, causes. Uh, for example. Uh, I would say anger. There are four causes for anger. Hurt, injustice, fear, and frustration. Anger is not the problem. If you get to the, what is causing this? If it's injustice, like Jesus, he had anger. He goes to the temple, turns the tables over, has a whip. You know, I, I mean, he solves the problem. So anger is like the red light on the dashboard of a car. Blare, blaring, what you know? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. So it motivates you to action. Mm. And so if you have a red light on your car, and uh, do you just keep driving and I don't care? No, you want to find out what what's causing it. Is it water in the radiator that's missing? You're down too low, and therefore you can have Overheating? Uh, is it oil? What What's needful? That's the way it is. We've got to figure out what is causing this and then deal with it. Um, whether it's, again, with anger, it's hurt, injustice, fear, and frustration. Now, another topic you need to start with the causes homosexuality. We have precious, precious results when, when people, people learn, oh, I was told I was born this way. But the, you look at the three causes uh, for male homosexuality and female, I mean, lesbians, and um, 
it, and there and every time I've ever talked to them one on radio, if they, uh, I'll just say, would you tell me what happened? Tell me what was your first sexual touch? And then they tell me, and I'm I'm asking specific questions, and I've seen so many people just set free because now they learn what God's best is for them, and uh, we just let them come to Christ and then be changed because it, it's precious when you realize that Jesus literally said the truth set you free. Mm. So if somebody has a misunderstanding of truth, mm -hmm. they think they've got truth. I'm, I'm one of those, I thought I had truth, but I didn't. I, I needed to line up my thinking with God's thinking. Then it's like, oh, so this is what God says about this. And that's why we have a hundred plus topics, whether it's the emotions, whether it's the abuse areas, whether it's literally addictions, and just the things that have people in bondage, or it can be purpose in life, and yeah. decision making, and the things that people, that, that, okay, I, I, I want to be healthy, and oh, I want to know what to do about uh, how to use my time, time management, yeah. all these things. So, so it, it's just a privilege. I cannot believe that I have the privilege of watching lives change. It's just amazing. It is amazing. And I, I want to be real right now to the audience. You know, I've gone to 75 countries and ministered in very large churches and many small churches as well over the last 20 years. And um, quite frankly, um, this material that Hope for the Heart Ministries has is um, really anointed, really thought through, very holistic and easy to use because I know that some of you are watching right now and most of you are not pastors. Uh, but if you are a pastor, please go check out Hope for the Heart Ministries and see that, that it, it's more than just getting a cell group together and appointing a group leader, leader and, you know, reading through the Bible and, and doing life together. I could be in a group for years and hide something from all these people that I go to church with every week. In fact, one of the best of best churches that um, in my books um, that, I, uh, um, that I've gone to, um, we met with a youth group of these teenagers and one of them said i just wish my church would teach me how to reach out to my friends who i think um, are being maybe abused um, and just wanting to let them know that um, jesus loves them another youth member of that church said i've been coming to this church for years but i've been sexually abused since I was age four and I haven't mm. told anybody. Mm. Mm. And so I just want you to know, like this was not long ago. And um, uh, this is so significantly important. If you're a pastor or leader at your church to check out these resources, um, it, it really needs to happen, in my opinion, in every single church where it's not really the leadership either. It's the members of the church and people who go to church every Sunday who are asking God, God, how else can I help? How can I be an extension of your hands and feet to help the brokenhearted? Um, you're never going to be on stage per se. You're not going to be a singer, an author, a, an executive leader. You've already volunteered at the church. You're doing this, you're doing that, but there's something more. Well, at Hope for the Heart Ministries, um, they're equipping churches, everyday people who are even seeing signs of, of maybe abuse in their youth group, and you just don't know what to do with it. Um, please go to Hope for the Heart Ministries, check it out and see if you can approach the leadership of your church to actually start um, this program as a caregiver, as the Hope for the Heart Ministries call it. You can be a caregiver of these souls, these spirits, 
that God dearly loves and he needs someone to let them know that they're loved and cared for. But you can't just pray things away. You can't just say, well, keep coming to church, keep reading your Bible. No. These are the layers that are detailed, complex, yet simply laid out, all biblically fatted up with scriptures on every single page, just about a resource where the ministry of Hope for the Heart Ministries might be a missing link between you and your next season in ministry within the church community you're already in. June, how, how might someone determine or identify a flag or a red flag or signals of seeing someone and noticing that they may have some abuse in their life right now? Are there any general signs that, you know, we have parents watching, we have youth group leaders watching, we have people who have friends that, you know, in the back of their mind, they don't know why, but they're, they're thinking that their friend is maybe thinking of ending their life one day, mm-hmm. right? Um, these thoughts, we need to capture them, think about them, process them. But in this context of abuse and identifying who in my community might actually be abused and be um, closer than you think. Mm-hmm. That's a people, great question. There are some people in my life, sure. My jaw was on the ground when I heard that they both abused. But my jaw was on the ground. Mm-hmm. I couldn't believe it. You, all along, what? Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty good at looking. Mm-hmm. But, but so I thought, but you just never would imagine that someone so close to you was so abused for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, wondering what to our view, viewers could you give some pointers to in regards to that? When life is not safe, then many times there can be withdrawal, uh, fear to speak out, um, and there can be a, a tendency uh, to literally uh, shut down. Mm. And so if, when you see, and that, this, see, this is what I saw. I saw certain girls uh, that were literally shut down, but there can also be a, an anger, a, a residing, it's like a, a, a bitterness, um, why? Because they don't, again, when I said the anger, the hurt, injustice, they experience injustice and they feel trapped mm. every time. So I use the story of, in our material, of childhood sexual abuse of Marilyn Vanderberg, who was Miss America. She was sexually abused from age 5 to 18. And she became a day child and a night child. And I've talked with her. Because I remember when she came out about her story, it shocked all these people. She had been Miss America, the, the number one speaker, female speaker of corporations. And then, and had never told what her father had done all those years. And then, so we tell her story all the way through, and it makes people go, they go, oh my God, you know, what, what do I do with this? And, and they, they can, part of this, a healthy solution is for them to read what somebody else has gone through and how they've call, literally been calmed, where Jesus calmed the storm and enters their their lives and uh, changes them inside out. But the point is, there are times when there needs to be confrontation. And see, that's where there are scriptures that are very specific that we need to know. The Bible says if someone sins against you, go in the sh- and show them the fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you point your brother over. If not, take two or three others with you. And then there's it goes on. But my, but I do say with childhood sexual abuse, it's got to be when you're safe. 
Mm. You, you confront when you're safe, but you need to go to a safe person who then can help you. Yeah. So sometimes there needs to be a delay. But I can tell you, it, for some, it is, wow, the, the yeah. relief of being able to get it out. Uh, but at the time, they many feel, I can't, I yeah. cannot. I, and they, they really are not prepared to emotionally yeah. and you have to wait until but but that doesn't mean you don't get someone uh, and, and one of the things that we say in our material is find a safe adult mm, that that's you right. can talk to that's it. at what point June should we go find a safe adult to talk to and if someone today calls the National Domestic Violence Hotline number what can they expect on that phone call? If you call that national number, they are going to ask you details. They're going to ask specifics. Who, when, where, and they'll, they'll need to have specifics. So you need to be aware that that will take place. But let me answer it also another way. I was asked at the Crystal College to do a J term, a January term, uh, which is typically two weeks. And I, they asked me to do it years ago on childhood sexual abuse. And I was very surprised. So every day we were doing aspects. And I noticed there was one student that did not give me eye contact ever and it was at the end of the third day and she came up to me and she said i just want you to know i think my brother could be sexually abusing his two daughters and i listened i said why do you think that because he abused me and I see they are responding like I responded years ago. And she said, I don't know what to do. I said, what do you think you should do? And she, you know, she was just wrestling. She said, I, I don't think I can tell because it'll blow up the family. And I said, and so if you didn't tell, how would you feel about that? She said, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't like what I'm seeing in my two nieces. I, I said, said 10 years from now, mm -hmm. 10 years from now, what would you be glad that you did? Mm -hmm. So simple. I would tell. I said, well, I'll tell you what you could do. You could place a call and report anonymously. And they're going to ask you details. But at least you would have tried. I said, this is a possibility. And uh, several months later, I got a call from her. She said, I reported about my nieces and I was concerned. And they said, so they had Child Protective Services and Bob, but they said they didn't have the proof. I said, but at least you did what you could. And you gave specifics. She called back later the next year, June. My brother is not in the home any longer. I said, really? What's happened? She said, someone else reported what he did because he said, because he already. Had a report had, against him. Mm -hmm. Wow. Then they were able to go in and they did 
believe wow. for sure. Wow, 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 wow. And then got confirmation from the nieces. Wow. So, the, I know it's hard. Mm. I know it's hard. But we've got to do what's right. Mm. And if you are called by God to report, you're doing this to stop what is ungodly, what's forbidden by God in the Bible, to have sexual relations with a close relative. And so, in, no matter what, uh, don't be silent. Just say, God, give me wisdom. Amen. Help me, help me know what my choices are. Mm. And there are godly people mm. who will help you walk through it. Amen. What would you tell someone right now who's watching? And feel free to look right into that camera. Um, if you're listening, your heart's open. This might be the very first time that they're watching anyone really talking to their heart about the abuse that they're in right now. What would you tell them right now? God knows the truth. And the truth, he says, set you free. What did he, what would he set you free to do? There are times when you're going to be called by God to speak the truth. And now why would you do that? Because you could be the rescuer. Mm. You could be used by God to rescue those who are being led away, the Bible says, to death. You know, there's a, a death of the spirit at times where people feel, I've died. They are physically alive, but, but they feel dead. Whatever you have experienced, our God is a compassionate God. Uh, let me explain one thing. You think, well, if God knows, why doesn't he stop it? That is a very common question. And I just want to tell you this. The first two people God created, Adam and Eve, he gave them a perfect environment, provided for them, and he told them only thing, one thing not to do. He, he told them only one thing not to do. Do not eat from this tree. What did they do? They went against God's will and ate from that tree. So notice, God gave them free will to go against his will. And what we see in life there will be people who will go against God's will. That's true. He allows people to go against his will. But the reverse would be he just made us all robots and we only had to do what was right in his sight. No, he set it up where people can choose to be self-willed. And there, there are times when you and me and Nick, that we will be victims of someone else's free will. And they can choose to go against God. Now, what you need to know is that's not the end of the story. Hmm. It's how God's going to later and over time use your life where if you are experiencing abuse and if you are led by God to report it, to stop it, because ultimately that's what should happen. And let's say it does stop the abuse, but why did God permit it in the first place? All I can say is God has a perfect will and God has a permissive will, but he will use whatever your experience is to develop what I call stretching your capacity for compassion 
in fact, very kind, candidly, those who work with domestic violence victims so often, most, most of the time, they are the ones who themselves were victimized. But you see, they have a huge compassion. And after the Lord is really allowed to heal us, then we care tremendously and we can make a difference because we understand it firsthand. It's not just theory. It's not just words that you read in a book or in a manual. And so you're going to be used by God, whether it's in your childhood, like childhood sexual abuse, the, the different types of, of pain that you have experienced that will be used pain with a purpose. And God is faithful to redeem those experiences so that you can make a difference in the lives of others. Amen. And to you who is watching and listening right now, I want to tell you that in my conversations with June, I've learned so many people feel like it's it's their own fault for being abused. I just want to tell you it's not your fault. That shame and condemnation and guilt, um, those things that weigh you down so heavy, you don't need to carry that anymore. It is not your fault. Don't make someone else's problem your problem. And on that note, I want to tell you that God has made sure that you were watching this program to let you know that he loves you. He hasn't forgotten you. Many people come up to me and say, wow, I can't imagine having a life without limbs. And I say, you know what? I can't imagine being in a home that's broken. I think that's worse than having no limbs. So we all have our burdens and disabilities and pain. But that shame and that guilt and that condemnation is the real disability. Those voices saying you'll never get out of this. Don't say anything. This is all your fault. You're not good enough. You'll never, ever be happy. No, how much we can rejoice in God in how he not only cleanses us and redeems us and frees us, but makes us brand new. And just like June has said, when you don't get a miracle, be one. <laughs> Understand that this is not the end of your story. You're still here. God and his mercy and his grace is bigger than anything that could ever happen to us. And I want to ask you, will you pray with you? And she's going to pray with you. Will you maybe for the first time in your life open up your heart, especially to Proverbs 3 verse 5, and trust in the Lord with your whole heart? and lean not upon your own understanding. Knowing that we need him is the first step. And I would love, June, if you could just pray for those who are watching right now. Open your heart to the Lord right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for understanding my pain, and my past. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you have a purpose for me. And right now, I yield my will to your will. Jesus, thank you for experiencing the horrible abuse on the cross of literally being willing to die on the cross for the times when I would choose wrong. But thank you that you have a plan for me. And so I yield all of me to all of you. Change me inside out and make me the person you created me to be. Lord, I give my life to you and ask Jesus to come in and take hold of my life. 
I give him all of me. And thank you for what you will do in me, to me, and through me. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. June, thank you so, so much for joining me here today. My honor, my joy, my delight, because there are people who trust you. Nick, they trust your heart, they trust your words, and they look at you and say, okay, if Nick can go forth in strength and in the power of God, maybe I can too. Mm. And it's not a maybe. No, you can. You can. Mm. And that's why you you know, God has divine appointments with people. And if you needed these words, if you needed to pray that prayer, God had a divine appointment with you so that you would literally allow him to take charge. And you're going to be amazed to see how God's going to use your past experience, the pain with a purpose, and it'll be you know, where you know it's because you wouldn't have had that experience. You wouldn't have been used otherwise in that way. It will be very purposeful by God's design. So I am I'm really thrilled for you, for your future. Amen. June, we love you so, so much. Thank you. And God bless you in the ministry as you continue to go forth. Thank you. Yeah. Um, everyone, June's ministry, Hope for the Heart, is a Champions for the Brokenhearted official partner who provides monthly biblical resources for each of our Champions topics. We have a lot more in the future that we'll talk about within that context of the partnership. We're so excited. But right now, I really urge you to go and learn more about our Champions for the Brokenhearted campaign um, and June's ministry, Hope for the Heart. Check out those websites. Um, and for anyone that you really believe needs to watch this episode with me and June, on abuse. Um, each month, Champions for the Brokenhearted uh, has a theme per month. And so please go visit lwl.tv to check out uh, what is the next month's theme. Love you all very, very much. God bless you. And thank you for your love and your prayers and support. May you be richly blessed in Him and know that you are precious. And uh, don't believe those little lies in your head. Read out loud the promises of God, and you'll see victory as you go forth one day at a time.